Uh, today's program is uh, really exciting because we are combining a lot of things together. So it's a part of the festival. It's uh, two exhibitions opening or viewing. Um, and it's also, we will be filming conversation with our, our the talk of our guests and it will be online and it will become a part of our program of discussions called Haval Conversations. So we have um, tripled the, <laughs> the, uh, today's event and we are really excited about having this wonderful exhibition here. It has been postponed for two and a half years, so finally it made its way to New York. Uh, so I will just uh, introduce, say a few words about the exhibit. Uh, or maybe I don't have to. <laughs> you will be talking about it, about the exhibit and book. And uh, so I will just introduce our speakers. So uh, uh, it is my great pleasure to welcome Eva Hay. Uh, she was born in Prague and graduated from Charles University. She began her career as a professional photographer and journalist in what was then Czechoslovakia. In 1985, she emigrated to the United States, where she lived for 20 years, working as a photographer for prestigious museums and galleries in New York. In 2005, she returned back to the Czech Republic, where she settled in the small town of Rožmetal pod Přemešinem, Central Bohemia. I visited her a few months ago. She has a beautiful garden with two, sh two I mean, sheep. <laughs> and uh, many other animals, so she, she really, she's amazing, she does so many things. Um, she acts also as a project manager of Czech National Trust and takes care of several projects of this non-profit organization. She is active as a journalist, photographer and writer and she also curates art shows. Uh, in her own artwork she concentrates on art projects experimenting with the use of photographic images. She has exhibited in leading galleries in New York as well as other parts of the United States and Europe. Alex Zucker is an accomplished translator of Czech literature with many important awards for his extensive work. Um, he has two translations out this year, The Lake, a novel by Bianca Belova, and the selected writings of Jan Patočka, Care for the Soul. He lived in Prague from 1990 to 1995 and currently lives in Brooklyn. Alex is also a social activist and spends a lot of time campaigning for human and social rights, especially in New York City. And you can find more about all his work on his website. And uh, last but not least, Maida Kalab Whitaker serves as a secretary of the board of directors of the Dvořák American Heritage Association. She's an independent scholar and museum consultant specializing in late 19th and early 20th century cultural and design history and has acted as an advisor for the Hast Vodakum project in BNH since 2006. Since the grand opening of the Dvořák room in 2011, she has presented lectures, walking tours and exhibits including New World Diplomacy, the contract that brought Antonin Vodak to America, uh, the hard 25 years of celebrating composer Antonin Dvořák and his American legacy and many others. So uh, thank you very much for coming and enjoy the program. The Ticket to the New World is a project that commemorates extraordinary individuals of the art scene who were forced to leave Czechoslovakia in the beginning of World War II to the United States and influence the cultural scene there. Those who returned home after the war brought with them new and invaluable experiences. Voskovets and Verich were a famous acting duo associated with the liberated theater during the First Republic. They were inspired by the comics of their time, such as Charlie Chaplin. They criticized Hitler and the Nazi regime and had to immigrate to the United States before the outbreak of World War II. After the war, they came back home, but then parted ways. 
Beric decided to stay and Voskovets returned to the States to build a career on Broadway and in Hollywood. His most significant role was in the movie 12 Angry Men. Jan Verich played in and directed films in Czechoslovakia and the two were not in contact for some time. Later, their brotherly bond was renewed through letters they sent to each other. Paul Fehrlinger is to this day at the top of the list of American animators. The son of Czech diplomats, he was born in Japan, brought to the US and placed into foster care in Burlington. He was returned to Czechoslovakia for political reasons, where he spent his teenage and young adult years in the communist regime. When he finally managed to return to America, he made a living by making short instructional clips and political commercials. He was the main author to a number of his projects as a scriptwriter, director, artist and animator. Later, he founded his own art studio, ARNT Associates, where he worked with his wife, Sandra. He worked on more than 700 projects from short animated movies to full feature-length films. He became renowned for films such as Rainbowland and the Oscar-winning It's So Nice to Have a Wolf Around the House. A man that had a significant role in the American art scene was oddly enough not an artist, but a theorist and curator, Thomas Messer. He moved to the United States in 1939 as a student on scholarship. Over time, he managed various art institutions until one day he was asked by Harry Guggenheim to become the director of the Guggenheim Museum in New York. He worked there for 27 years. During that time, he noticeably expanded its collection. He also succeeded in connecting the Venice collection of Peggy Guggenheim to the New York institution. He curated a number of exhibitions by famous American artists and presented artists from Europe as well as other parts of the world. The New York Times wrote that Thomas Messer was one of the most significant figures of American modern art. The trip into immigration alone during the tense atmosphere of the 1930s and 40s was frequently complicated and dangerous. In addition, for artists who were renowned at home, it meant to start all over again. Nonetheless, many succeeded and were able to contribute in an important way. The Ticket to the New World offers a glimpse into the often complicated lives of these people and brings a new perspective on Czech American relations. All right, so uh, we already had the introductions. I just want to say I'm um, personally very grateful to be here. Um, thank you, Pavla, for inviting me to take part in this event, getting to meet Eva and learn about um, some important uh, figures in Czech culture I do, didn't know about otherwise. And thank you to the uh, Václav Havel Library Foundation for putting on this series. And, um, and so we'll just jump right in. And um, I got a couple questions for Eva to start with about the conception of the book. And then we'll start talking about all the people, some of whose, well, the people whose work you see around you here on the walls. So um, what led you to create this book is the first basic question. Well, um, I uh, really, uh, when I went back to Czech Republic 2005, which was like, it's some um, 17 years ago now, um, I it was quite difficult for me. It's always difficult to change the life this way and uh, uh, it was difficult to come here and settle and it was difficult to come back and settle but since i was living here 20 years it was like um, i really miss new york so much and i uh, i was coming back every year because i had clients here and i had uh, uh, some projects which i did over here and for some, during this, some period of time, I wasn't even sure where I am home, you know. It was kind of like a weird, weird feeling. So, 
when I came here and the, the, the guy uh, at the immigration told me, welcome home. I, 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 for, for a while I had feeling that I am more home than in, Czechoslovak in Czech Republic. And uh, so I sort of uh, was thinking about my memories uh, and uh, suddenly I realized when I came here in 1985, I met several people who sort of stick in my memory, uh, stuck in my memory and are still present and it occurred to me that it would be fine to uh, really somehow put their stories down and uh, when I came here I still remember uh, Alexander Hackenschmidt, uh, he really, I had really sp special uh, ties toward this uh, photographer because uh, he, I actually wrote a diploma about Czech photographic avant-garde and he was kind of like a, one of my, one of my people who were present in this diploma and uh, then I met him over here and I actually find out that uh, his, uh, uh, his, we, we, we had some kind of like a relationship because, uh, I mean, like relatives, uh, so it was very, very weird and I, uh, it was for me, it was uh, really great uh, to meet him here and to know him. And uh, the same with, with Mr. Greenswijk, I was able to meet or one of the first people whom I met over here was uh, uh, Mrs. Dana Minzer. She was uh, at the time curator of, uh, uh, of uh, Metropolitan Museum of Islamic Collection and she knew all the people over here and uh, even and before she came here she was a journalist and she really uh, was one of the Chapek group, those journalists who met uh, in this uh, writer Chapek in his uh, villa in Vinogrady. And she continues. Uh, I actually find out uh, when I went to uh, to the old uh, Narodny Listy, which was Czech newspaper here during the war, uh, I found out that she was contributing almost every week uh, with some article over there. And she had this uh, nephew and that was Paul Fehringer. So it was sort of somehow connected and I said to myself, okay, that was very uh, difficult situation at the time when they came. Uh, those were incredible fates and stories connected to their lives, connected to their, their work and lives. So uh, I said maybe it would be great to somehow put it down and do something about these people. And it actually ended up uh, that uh, yeah, since I was uh, at the time director of Czech National Trust, uh, so I ended up uh, put together project which was really in Prague it was quite big because it was like uh, uh, some 18 programs connected to different exhibitions and there was a lot of institutions involved in the program and uh, there was this major show uh, uh, outdoor show on uh, Kampa uh, where these people uh, went uh, individual stories of these 18 people which are which are picked uh, picked for this book and for this project were presented so um, it was really ended up like, like a large pro a large project can you just uh, um, explain for people maybe a little bit about what the czech national trust is yeah that's what i wanted oh, okay. to say <laughs> that's, a, that's a good question uh, so Czech National Trust is ch uh, charity basically, it's organization which is really, uh, idea came out from uh, English National Trust, uh, it's this uh, uh, main idea is to uh, really save the heritage for the future generation, generation and it's on the basis of volunteer 
uh, volunteering work. So uh, all of us who work for Czech National Trust are volunteers. In other words, we don't get any pay. And uh, it's like we're trying to save uh, some monuments. Uh, for example, I have special uh, special project in my hometown, hometown which is Rosmita Potsimshina, where I'm taking care of the castle from uh, 13th century. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, also includes uh, not only tangible heritage, but also intangible heritage, which was this project, like to uh, sort of uh, concentrate on history and uh, heritage, which otherwise would be lost. And uh, uh, we are, uh, Czech National Trust is part of a uh, big family, International National Trust Organization, which is about uh, 70 other trusts all over the world, which are working together and finding the ways how to uh, really, uh, really take care of the heritage the way that uh, it would be somehow uh, able, uh, the, the future generation would be able to uh, somehow uh, enjoy it. So, uh, I think that uh, uh, that is very important and uh, if you would be interested somebody from you uh, to uh, somehow cooperate with us in this cause, uh, there's, a, uh, there's a poster which uh, can take you to our website and uh, see what, what we are doing. Okay. Um, so I don't know if you have any interesting, specifically interesting stories about the book coming together that you want to share with people tonight, or whether you just want to wait and bring them up as we go along, or? Well, I think I want to um, mention some stories which are connected to the people which are basically exhibit, whose, uh, which work is exhibited uh, here, so that means uh, Alexander Hamid and uh, Greenzweig, Sutnar and uh, Peltz and uh, Hofmeister. And this is like, this part is chosen because it's a visual part, so mm -hmm. it can be sort of presented uh, uh, in the exhibition. There we, then we will have a screening of the film on Thursday, which will bring uh, the uh, stories, which will bring the film of uh, uh, Paul Firminger. Okay. So, uh, I have to say that uh, it's uh, kind of like a, uh, the situation when these people were leaving the Czechoslovakia in 1938 uh, was really a very difficult one and uh, not everybody was able to see what's going to happen. It was kind of like a, uh, now before the war with Ukraine, I was thinking about it again, how we didn't really believe that Putin, Putin will go to the war, that we saw that maybe it's some, some pretension or it's not going to happen. But, and uh, basically, when you go to the archive materials, you can see that some people saw that uh, even in the beginning of World War II, even our allies, like England and France, they saw that uh, once they gave up the Sudetenlands, it's going to be fine and nothing will happen. Which uh, so some people really didn't go, but there were people who definitely were decided to leave because they knew that uh, they had to run for their lives. And especially the people who really somehow was were already in some uh, Nazi resist, uh, Nazi uh, fighting against Nazism, and uh, so they have to really, uh, really leave the country. And uh, there were several groups because uh, the first one was somehow connected to uh, New York World Fair in 19. Which was a major event uh, before World War II here in New York. 
and uh, this was a huge showcase of, uh, uh, of uh, modern technique and modern architecture and uh, Czechoslovakia was part of it and uh, uh, the, during the uh, 1938 uh, they built a uh, uh, beautiful Czechoslovakian pavilion at this uh, Flushing Meadows area where the, where the uh, event took place. And a uh, whole group of people were sort of connected to preparation of that uh, pavilion. And one of the major figures was uh, Ladislav Sutner, who is what we have here right behind us. And uh, he uh, it was a very interesting story because he uh, was sitting on the train leaving to, uh, for New York and uh, it was in the middle of March and uh, Hitler came to Prague and he was called from, from the train mm. and uh, was like uh, nothing, the whole uh, German decided they will not really pursue the, the they will not really follow with the uh, with the pavilion and they will close the whole thing and there's going to be no because no check ex exposition in this uh, at this fair. Uh, so uh, Sutner. Uh, was called and uh, he got instruction that he was supposed to go in the end, but he has to dismantle the pavilion and he has to take everything down and close the whole thing. So Sutna left, but he decided on the contrary to open the pavilion, to how to really uh, prepare the whole exhibition which was really less than it was supposed to be that but uh, still they managed and uh, there were like plenty of people who were compatriots over here who were supporting the cause and basically the whole thing uh, over there when they opened the pavilion was the uh, Ed Edward Bernesch came and uh, Roosevelt at the time uh, for the first time said that uh, Czechoslovakia still exists, that uh, they will support the, their fight for their existence. So it was basically first uh, first resistance uh, outside of uh, outside Czechoslovakia, which was which was here. Right. And you said you were telling me also that um, the. World's Fair was how Sutnar, Hamid, and Gunzweig met. Yes, they, uh, they... Uh, so this is a designer, photographer, a designer and two photographers. Yeah, actually yeah. Uh, the connection is that uh, uh, Alexander Hamid was the... Um, before, uh, before 1938, he was a filmmaker and photographer. And he was a very talented young man and he uh, really did a film with Herbert Klein, which was called Crisis. And it was about the rise of Nazism in Europe. And this film actually was uh, screened in a uh, Czech pavilion. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, Hackenschmidt uh, had to really leave the country because he, was, he did this film and other films uh, which were against uh, fascism. And uh, uh, so he had to leave, and Herbert Klein uh, basically helped him to leave the country to acquire the visa and uh, come here. Uh, so that's how the film and Sutnar and Hackenschmidt uh, get to know each other. And uh, uh, Greenswijk uh, was a young man who was uh, Jewish, and uh, he really left because uh, he was like Jewish and uh, uh, he left his family, uh, his parents uh, at home, they didn't, didn't want to go, and all his life he felt guilty because they died in concentration camp there. And Greenswag was the young man who didn't have work, didn't have any job, so he was the one 
who was screening, who was like the technically projecting uh, the film in the in the, uh, yeah. in the uh, pavilion. So, but, uh, uh, and also there was another man uh, who came as a uh, architect and uh, that was J.J. Uh, Poivka who ended up again then later on in uh, West Coast and uh, was the major architect and teacher at West Coast and actually was cooperator of uh, Frank, Frank Lloyd Wright and he uh, uh, really, uh, he was really good structural designer so he did uh, this work for uh, Frank Lloyd Wright in uh, case of uh, uh, Guggenheim Museum. So thanks to Polivka, we don't have uh, uh, some kind of pillars, supporting oh, pillars, okay. and there is this beautiful, beautiful spiral which is inside the interior of uh, Guggenheim Museum. So there was the whole group of these people who met uh, at this uh, occasion and also Edward Benish came, opened the pavilion, and there were whole, all newspapers were writing, Czech newspapers, magazines, and so on. Uh, but this, uh, uh, as we know, the, the, the uh, New York warfare has been closed in two years because at the time uh, when uh, really uh, Everybody, and there was this beautiful architecture and whole thing was called World of Tomorrow. Uh, at the same time, suddenly in Europe, the, uh, Europe was destroyed by, by German, uh, German airplanes and German bombs and all architecture went. <laughs> so, so basically it was closed because of World War II. And it's interesting that some of the stru iron structures used for the pavilions were, uh, were changed to uh, weapons yeah, to really the to fight the, fight the Germans. So it's just it was absolutely incredible time. And uh, the people who came here were really uh, didn't have work. They, didn't have job. They were like, uh, uh, like Sutner was a very famous figure already in Prague. He was one of the major uh, functionalist uh, designer, and uh, he was uh, uh, figure. He was a teacher in the, the. He was director of the school of graphic design. He was uh, really designing the shows. Uh, Inter international expositions. So he was really somebody in Czechoslovakia. Can I just interject though to say that one fascinating, and maybe not super important in terms of his overall career as a designer, but Ladislav Sutnar was the person who invented the parentheses that go around the area code and phone numbers when he had a job designing the phone book. Yeah, yeah. 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 and not only that, he was like, he is actually considered like a grandfather of American graphic design. So he was really, but in the beginning he really was nobody and he had to start from scratch really. And his designs in the beginning were considered really too um, avant-garde for the for this uh, scene, you know, for American scene. Uh, he wanted to uh, he wanted to do some uh, modern toys, for example, and he didn't succeed. It. So later on, he actually. Uh, through his connection with Bauhaus, because we were all connected in, at the time before World War II, that Prague was really center of uh, avant-garde, left-wing uh, avant-garde, avant-garde, Bauhaus, and everything was uh, really, it was like a little Paris, really. And uh, uh, Sutnar uh, uh, had this connection, because a lot of these people from Bauhaus came here, to America 
because Hitler really didn't like this avant-garde art, art. He really hated. He had this different type of art, which he. Uh, so um, they came here because they were afraid. So through this connection, he finally found uh, work in. Uh, something that was called uh, Sweet Catalog Services. He has some, some of his designs over here. Uh, uh, it was basically catalogs, like, which were sent, uh, production catalogs, which were sent to people. They were supposed to pick up some materials or some products from it. And uh, in the beginning, it was done by typesetters. It yeah. wasn't really, it wasn't really job, you know. And uh, what Sutnar did was that he managed to really change it, like a not only great tool but also piece of art. So it was really something. He never signed that. It was very anonymous, and he started there, uh, 1941, and with really great amount of these um, uh, these uh, catalogs and uh, he concentrated on visual flaw so that means that he sort of was taking the eye of uh, the person who, who was watching the, the poster or whatever it was and uh, really oriented the person through the visual uh, flaw. Uh, a little bit later, 1951, he uh, opened his own studio and later on uh, he had his son Radoslav uh, working with him in the studio and he did a lot of, uh, and he uh, made, uh, he wrote a nature book on graphic design which is called Visual Design in Action. And later on, actually came a lot of a lot of jobs, as you said, parentheses, because he was really um, organizing yellow pages. Mm -hmm. He also did uh, 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 traffic signs. Mm -hmm. All these kind of uh, jobs, uh, he he really was, uh, and he was almost forgotten. Um, uh, finally, to 2003, uh, 2003 uh, uh, Museum of Decorative Arts, uh, really together with uh, Cooper Hewitt uh, Museum, did together a major show in Prague, mm -hmm. and uh, now he even has his own uh, the school in Plzeň, mm -hmm. Design School in Plzeň College. Is named after him, but uh, mm -hmm. he's a really great uh, designer. Mm -hmm. So just not to, and I'm sure we can talk about Sutnar, but I'm just keeping an eye on yeah, the time. Yeah. <laughs> and we've got all these other great artists also, whose work is featured here and in the book. So um, maybe you could say a little bit more though. So we have photos here. These are on the left here. Uh, those are Sasha Hamid's photographs. Yes. Right? And these are Bedshe Kurunsvai. But you can track, yeah. yeah, so maybe you can talk a little bit about um, their um, their personal stories and their work and how they got here. Um, and then from there we'll move on to Hofmeister and Peltz, the character. His name uh, in Czechoslovakia was Alexander Hartmann. He changed the name when he came here. And he was a uh, really extremely talented uh, young man he started with photography when he was 15 and he managed to uh, really very early to start with film because his, his photography was basically a way how to get to film and uh, there was this uh, great film studio in Zlín where Batya really managed to uh, managed to bring a lot of young filmmakers who were uh, really willing to experiment, uh, experiment, and they did a lot of films, like advertising films, but they... Bach is a shoemaker, for those who yeah. are familiar with it. Yeah, yeah. so uh, they, uh, and over here he uh, 
started this film and later started to cooperate with uh, Herbert Klein, as I said, and came to here. And over here, he met uh, such a dynamic young woman. Uh, her name was Maya Deren. And she was really extraordinary dancer and choreographer and poet and photographer. And, and uh, she was very avant-garde person they got together and he really, he married, they got married and uh, uh, Maya, together they did a major experimental film, it's, it's I consider it like a first experimental film or major experimental film here in America, uh, which is called Meshes in the Afternoon and um, it's sort of like a going, uh, asking about identity of person and, uh, 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 and uh, subconsciousness and stuff like that. So it's, uh, it was very interesting and Sasha, uh, even though he, they got divorced and he, he had another um, wife later on um, who's also a filmmaker, he, and photographer, he, uh, really, uh, still, be, uh, still was a great experiment, experimentator. Uh, he, uh, he uh, actually worked on several commissions for the United Nations, and then in 1964 he made a film for uh, another, the Second World War. Uh, New York World War Fair, which was 1964, and uh, this time his film was projected on three screens. Mm -hmm. So it was something very unusual. And later on, he even did six screens. <laughs> so it was really, it was really interesting. And the film, uh, which names uh, uh, is "To Be Alive," uh, got Academy Award. Uh, so he was, it was really considered like a major. You said he worked on early versions of the IMAX too, is that yes. right? Yeah. Yes, he was, uh, that's exactly true, yeah. And uh, uh, so he edited IMAX films for the, basically the, before he left and retired. So he was major uh, filmmaker, who did a lot of experiments in his life. So Grinswijk uh, uh, also worked for the United Nations. It was like uh, for several years uh, when he uh, uh, was really, really taking care of broadcasting there about uh, audiovisual programs. He was sent to uh, do some audiovisual programs uh, like uh, like a interaction like peacemaking and stuff like that. Um, but uh, in his free time, he always photographed. He he was fascinated by New York, and as soon as he came here, he started to photograph. And uh, uh, he did this type of uh, human-oriented uh, photography when he is. Uh, he was very sensitive to uh, human struggling and tragedy and all these uh, unusual situations you could see in the street. Uh, uh, the one uh, uh, over there, which is uh, called Between Heaven and Earth, uh, uh, won him uh, first prize in US camera uh, competition and uh, so he was which, which one the, the one the one where the guy is washing the oh, between heaven and earth. Yeah, between heaven and earth. And uh, he uh, really mm, concentrated on this work. And when he uh, retired uh, in uh, uh, his UN mission, he uh, started to work with uh, uh, International Center of Photography. And he became right hand of Cornel Kappa. And thanks to him, for example, he was really instrumental with the Czech show 
and uh, ICT uh, in, uh, I think it was 92, uh, which was really, uh, really a major show of Czech photography history in modern photography. So Mr. Andjar was creating this show and it was really uh, something very important for Czech photography. So, and he, his uh, photographs are still violated uh, very much today. Howard Greenberg Gallery uh, really carries them and uh, they are very, uh, very much part of the photography history. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's Green's work. <laughs> okay. Um, so, okay, let's move on then to talk about um, Adolf Hofmeister and Antoni Peltz, who were uh, not only but known best for their caricatures, and we can see those um, over here on the, your right or left uh, wall. And um, mm, I don't know if you want to talk about specifically how they came to the U.S. or focus more on their involvement in the resistance, I or talk about the MoMA <laughs> exhibition. <laughs> I think uh, they were their trip to. <coughs> United States was very interesting because uh, Adolf Hofmeister was a very dynamic person and in, as a young man and uh, he uh, also was uh, involved in all, all over, all over, like he was one of the founders of the Vietzel, which was like wing avant-garde avant group. He was uh, uh, drawing and painting and curating and writing, so he was really uh, sort of very active. And it was very funny because he, uh, this Devietze was sort of anti-bourgeois movement, but Adolf Hofmeister was from a really kind of rich family and he enjoyed like basically bourgeois life, you know, <laughs> because um, it's all about this left-wing avant-garde in Prague. They were all uh, left-oriented, but uh, they can imagine really at the time what will happen after the communists will really take uh, over, you know. So uh, Adolf Hofmeister then uh, uh, was also involved in, uh, he was friend of Voskovec uh, uh, and he uh, he uh, wrote for Liberated Theater, also was in, uh, involved in anti-fascist movement and uh, uh, really was helping refugees which were coming from Germany. So he had to leave. He had to leave and he left uh, Paris, so he left for Paris and he opened uh, the house of Czechoslovakian culture there. Uh, which was sort of like a residence of Czech artists who were coming uh, from Czechoslovakia because they had to leave. Uh, that was in, uh, in spring uh, 1940, 1939, and in, in the fall, the uh, French police uh, raided this house and they were uh, sort of, uh, uh, they were all detained, like, uh, for, uh, and really put to the jail because of espionage. So they, they were s sort of, they saw that uh, uh, the, the house was center of Communist Party and they were working for Soviets and all this stuff. So. Uh, they spent uh, a really long time, in uh, about six months, in uh, the prison, La Santa prison, and in Paris. And then they were, then they traveled them uh, through uh, several detention camps. And finally, they were able to board the ship for Morocco. Mm -hmm. But there. In Morocco, they were detained again as unwanted people who came there. So it was almost endless story 
when they went from jail to jail and from prison <laughs> to prison. And for Hofmeister, really, at the time, uh, it was a story that really helped Voskovets and Weich uh, and uh, the, wife, the wife of Weich really helped them somehow obtain the visa and they, because it wasn't easy to obtain an American visa and also you have to have some amount of money to get in the country. So all this was going to somehow help of Meister. And the other, there were like four people who were running like that and jail like that. And it was like, another one was Alan Gibbish who was very, very good painter. And uh, also another painter whose name was Mark Kopf, who stayed later on here in, uh, in America. Uh, so all these four people were, went through this horrible fate and finally got into, uh, into the United States through Martinique. Mm -hmm. These three, the other three went through Martinique and they were also jailed for some time and finally got over here. And uh, uh, Peltz was so happy to really be here somewhere else than in jail. He started immediately like, uh, really a great production of these caricatures, uh, which were, uh, he did them, he did uh, for magazines and newspapers and Hofmeister also, he, um, uh, you can see one of the pictures over there is actually a picture of New York Times where they, where they were publishing all those, uh, all those caricatures. And uh, uh, especially Peltz had really won some prize uh, for in the competition which MoMA, uh, uh, MoMA at the time really Open for for artists and uh, so that when that actually opened the situation that uh, these two people Hofmeister and Pals had a show had an exhibition of caricatures uh, in uh, in Museum of Modern Art and uh, uh, it was actually the first show in Museum. Of that was the first one. Yeah, that was the first one. So, um, 1943. 1943. 1943. And uh, uh, actually, uh, the show opened. Uh, uh, he was not at the opening, but uh, uh -huh. like two days later, President Edward Banesh came there and uh, all, all the Czech exiled people were there, so. May I share this story? Now? Yeah, share okay, this okay. story. <laughs> so this is, this is uh, a story that's in the book, which I personally like, maybe we're gonna find out how many people in this room share my sense of humor, or have a sense of humor, really. So, um, I'm just gonna read out of the book here. So it says that, um, in 1943, Hofmeister exhibited political caricatures together with Antonin Peltz under the pseudonym A.T. Peel in the Museum of Modern Art, MoMA, in New York. It was a big thing. The opening was to be attended by a president in exile, Edvard Benesch, who, as was widely known, had absolutely no sense of humor. Tony Kraber, American singer and colleague of Voskovets and Vedic. So we haven't talked about Voskovets and Vedic. So Voskovets and Vedic, well, we, we did, you did mention them and they're in the intro film. But, you know, they were, um, they did social satire, political comedy. It was all language based. It was all like language, it was their whole, um, it was all centered around language play. They were incredibly clever when it came to words and they wrote songs and they also incorporated jazz at a time that this was in the 20s. This picture over here, that's um, Yezhek, I believe, right? Who, yes. Who wrote them, so that's, um, was it Yosef? Uh, yeah, Yosef Yezhek, thank you. I, yeah. I was gonna say yeah, Yaroslav. Yeah. Yaroslav. Yeah. Yaroslav, okay. Yaroslav Yezhek, uh, who wrote the, the jazz music that 
accompany the Voskovets and Vedic uh, musicals. So anyway, so Voskovets and Vedic, very humor-oriented, language-oriented people. So Tony Kraber, American singer and colleague of Voskovets and Vedic, wished to address the president in Czech and forced his friends to teach him the words. Um, as expected, uh, they didn't, Voskowitz and Vedek didn't lose their sense of humor, and Tony eventually approached the poor president with the following nonsense words, Nejeru met sem totish zeleni vu. I don't pig out on honey because I am a green ox slash idiot. So vu means both ox and idiot. And it says here, everyone laughed, only Mr. President didn't. <laughs> I just thought that was, you know, I, I just love picturing that whole scene playing out in my mind. Yeah. Um, some of the stories, uh, uh, like the uh, uh, story about Hofmeister actually was written uh, by Adam Hofmeister and his brother Martin, and uh, they are very, uh, they are very, really, uh, humorous and uh, there are a lot of like sort of behind the scenes uh, stories uh -huh. so I, I really like it. I, uh, I didn't mention here when I came to that the whole book uh, is not written uh, by me. I wrote, uh, I edited the book, I came with the, uh, with the whole concept uh, uh, but uh, and I always uh, because it's divided to several, uh, several sort of Chapters and I always uh, wrote the introductory uh, introductory text for each chapter and uh, wrote the text about um, Thomas Messer. But uh, this was uh, I really find some uh, interesting people who were experts or were somehow connected with uh, uh, with uh, with this uh, introduction of these personalities like. Uh, uh, my nephew, example, was the one who wrote uh, the story about uh, Mr. Phil Kushner. So, uh, uh, Do you want to pause here and go, go pass it on to Maya to talk about your uh, Maybe I finish with, uh, with Hofmeister sure. because I, yeah. uh, I would like to still mention one thing. Uh, they were involved uh, also with uh, 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 with the parade, which is called uh, in the parade, which is called, which was called uh, New York at War. Uh, it was actually tomorrow will be 80 anniversary of this parade, which was the biggest parade which was held in New York, and uh, it was the parade was uh, also reaction on Legitza, which really happened just a few weeks before. And uh, uh, Czechoslovakia had this float there, parade float, and it was uh, really decorated by Sutnar and uh, by Baltz and by, uh, by Hofmeister. So it was something uh, which they really I have to say that almost all of them was working for the Czechoslovakian cause, uh, Sutnar, for all his life, uh, many of them all his life. So it was really, uh, really uh, important for them. And uh, okay. All right. Yes. So so yes. Take it away. My there is something okay. which connects to you there. Exactly. Well, Lidice, uh, um was this terrible moment, um, uh, reprisal for uh, the assassination of Heydrich, um, and uh, the entire village was decimated. Probably most of you know the story. There was just a very interesting program several days ago here in the Bohemian National Hall on that um, outrage. Uh, so. The artistic response uh, was quite uh, large. Many people uh, were involved, but especially the Czechs. And the uh, event that I will get into uh, involves uh, Yarmila Novotna, the famous opera star and actress, actually, also. Um, 
in uh, Lidice took place on June 10th massacre of 1942 and um, just in the process of being recorded was a, a group of folk songs, uh, Czech folk songs and um, it was Yarmila Novotná uh, singing and she was accompanied by Jan Masaryk, the son of the former president of Czechoslovakia, the first president and um, Tomas Garik Masaryk, and um, actually Jan, it might surprise you, he was the foreign minister in exile, but he was actually a very good pianist, amateur, but um, his mother uh, had been studying at the conservatory in Leipzig, so um, the family of the Gariks, so we have Tomas Garik Masaryk, he adopted his wife's name as his middle name, uh, she was the one who brought the talent in music, and Jan picked up on it. So Jan at the piano and Yarmila sing, uh, singing. They had been at a party in New York. There was uh, a fair amount of socializing. Again, Yarmila being an opera star with the Metropolitan Opera already at that point. And um, a New York Times critic, music critic at the time, Olin Downs, was present at this event. And Yarmila, who knew uh, Masaryk from way back, uh, uh, was singing and he was playing. And uh, Olin Downs said, you must record this. And uh, RCA Victor picked it up. And so this was then being recorded in May before the events at Lidice before the Heydrich assassination, but they immediately decided to dedicate the record uh, to um, the people of Lidice, and so the album was called Songs of Lidice, and it was 15 very typical Czech folk songs, very simple, and sung very simply with an amateur pianist, Jan Masaryk. Uh, and uh, this was publicized uh, really around the nation and there were many other artistic responses of course with making of posters and um, even Edna St. Vincent Millay uh, wrote a poem and it was released about the same time as this RCA Victor um, record um, and Yarmila uh, you know went around the country with promotional efforts that were uh, put together by uh, RCA Victor, and this was really a, a major effort to, uh, you know, increase awareness. And I think it really was a moment, a turning moment for Americans uh, realizing what was going on uh, with Hitler directly, uh, and uh, you know, comparable to what we're experiencing now in Ukraine. Um, uh, one really has to go back uh, further um, with, uh, to understand this relationship and very close friendship between Yarmila and Jan Masaryk. Uh, uh, and a, a little bit I'll say here about the uh, career, the incredible career of uh, Yarmila. She, at 17, age 17, she made her debut at the National Theater. Um, in Prague, and uh, she debuted with The Bartered Bride, and uh, six days later she sang La Traviata, uh, the role of Violetta, at the age of 17. So uh, she was really um, immediately overnight a star. She really, she never went to the conservatory, but she came from a musical family, and uh, her father sang with the Sokol uh, groups, and she was from Prague, Vinohrady, I understand, and uh, so it was a musical family. They went to the opera together. It was opera was very present in Czechoslovakia, so she had this incredible natural talent, and then she was uh, brought to the uh, up through the ranks at the National Theater. So um, she came to notice of Tomasz Garig Masaryk. And she was invited to um, Chateau or Zamek Lani, which was the summer uh, place of the Masaryk family, President Masaryk. So she was invited to participate in a musicale. 
And um, from there, uh, Masaryk took a personal interest in her career and uh, provided funds for her study in Italy uh, and really uh, fostered uh, her as a kind of ambassador of Czech uh, music and culture. And the other person who was tapped in the same way was Rudolf Firkushny. Uh, he was also uh, brought into the Masaryk family of musicians, if you will. And um, I have in the exhibit, which hopefully you'll take a look at after uh, this talk, um, in the Dvořák room, uh, we actually have, a, it's a facsimile because it's too precious to have the original on view, but it's a little um, program from a musicale in which uh, Firkushny at the age of 12 or 13 was invited to participate and um, and Yarmila Novana who was 18 already, she had made it to 18, so uh, this was 1925. So the two of them would cross paths constantly during their careers, Rudolf Firkushny uh, again being a wonderful uh, uh, talent from a young age and uh, a prodigy at age five was studying with Leos Janáček and uh, so he carried an incredible uh, tradition of Czech music in his uh, memory and uh, throughout his career as a concert pianist around the world really. Um, so these were ambassadors uh, for Czech music and uh, I wanted to backtrack a little bit, uh, which was just talk about how they came to America because it involves, well, at least with Yarmila, it involves the World's Fair again of 1939. Yarmila, uh, um, one of the great conductors that she uh, appeared under was Arturo Toscanini. And uh, she, uh, he was infatuated with her. So uh, she was featured at the Salzburg Festival, I think it was about 1937, in the role of Gilda in Rigoletto. Uh, and so uh, Toscanini invited her to come to the World's Fair, to open the World's Fair with him in a performance. And right now I'm not remembering which one, it might have been Violetta, but uh, I can check that <laughs> later. But in any case, she jumped at it. And so we're talking about 1939, and uh, what, when did the fair open? What was the day? Uh, Eva has talked about, uh, but she was here to open the, the, with this operatic performance. Problem was that Toscanini got, they were practicing in their hotels and everything, but they got to the World's Fair grounds, and Toscanini heard the planes flying overhead. So he pulled out. He said, I, I'm not going to conduct under such circumstances. And I think Yarmela, I don't know the end of that story, I think she did ultimately appear, but the incredible gift that Toscanini uh, made or gave her was an introduction to the Metropolitan uh, Opera. And uh, he said, let's go. Um, and he hadn't been there himself for a number of years because apparently had a falling out with uh, whoever was the uh, general manager then, somebody by the name of Johnson. It was before Rudolph Bing. And uh, in any case, he walked in and he said, you're stupid. You haven't hired Yaramil and Nova not yet for anything. And they hired her on the spot. Uh, with this recommendation of Toscanini and um, she of course had an incredible career at that point behind her because she had been in Berlin and uh, Vienna for many years, uh, uh, still very youthful uh, and you'll see that whole story when you go into the Dvořák room so I'm not going to go through those details but that was how she was introduced to the Metropolitan Opera and she uh, she went back once still to Europe to bring her family back with her, but she was one of the first ones to really settle and have a career in front of her because she had that contract uh, with the Metropolitan Opera. And uh, so that was history because uh, from 1940 to 1956, she, was, uh, she did over 200 performances and uh, as many times as possible uh, was uh, singing on behalf of the Czech uh, 
music and traveled across the United States in many capacities. So she was contributing to this war effort uh, in, in many, many ways, uh, an incredible talent. Um, and likewise, um, good old Thirkushni was uh, traveling both of them incredibly self-disciplined and um, just non-stop travel with Yara Milanova now there's some statistic like she she signed with these uh, organizations that, that that would go to you know auditoriums in small towns across the United States and um, bring awareness of Czech music this way and of course many Czech communities still existed at that point so they were included but um, I understand the second half of many of her programs, she put on Czech costume and uh, was uh, dancing and singing uh, these folk songs again that uh, we know through the uh, Lidice album. So uh, there were many other sort of, uh, I would say symbolic moments that we could cite just quickly um, uh, as part of this war period. Um, the uh, Dvozhak, the anniversary, the 100th anniversary of Dvozhak's birth occurred in 1941, just several days after Pearl Harbor. And uh, there was a dedication ceremony for the plaque that you actually can see out here, uh, and, and now resides here in the Bohemian National Hall, but it was uh, placed on the facade of Dvozhak House. Uh, which is the house where Antonin Dvořák lived during his American residency from 1892 to 1895. And um, so this was a very key moment. Uh, Mayor Fiorello LaGuardia was there. Uh, Jan Masaryk was there at this dedication ceremony. And a lot of um, people were moved by the thought of uh, Dvořák having composed the New World Symphony in, in that house and um, remembering that as uh, America finally was launched into World War II because that happened with uh, Pearl Harbor basically. So um, this group of still uh, living students of Dvořák were there, Harry Burley, uh, the African-American who uh, was at the conservatory where Dvořák was director, was present, Rudolf Firkushny was present, and so was Yarmila Novotná, and they performed together the biblical songs uh, that Dvořák had uh, written while in New York at that uh, location, which was uh, 327 East 17th Street. And then I might mention just one more uh, event that brought them all together, uh, which was the celebration of the 25th anniversary of the founding of Czechoslovakia, which took place on October 28th in uh, 1942. So we're, you know, all these events are still pretty early in the war and very important to raise awareness of, of the situation of Czechoslovakia and in fact all of Europe. So um, that event took place uh, at Carnegie Hall um, with the New York Philharmonic, which had premiered the New World Symphony. And um, the program was all Czech. Artur Rodzinski was the conductor, but uh, it was at that event that Bohuslav Martinu's work, a memorial to Lidice, was uh, premiered. And uh, Rudolf Firkushny played his signature piece, which was uh, the Dvořák uh, Piano Concerto. And uh, that's a story I forgot to tell, but he barely had that um, uh, manuscript uh, with him. Um, he had met Yarmila <laughs> Novak, no, excuse me for backtracking this way, but it's an interesting story. When he was making his way uh, toward America, he left soon after uh, uh, the Germans marched into Czechoslovakia, and but he was touring, uh, uh, concertizing, and he ended up in Ostende uh, at the same time as Yaromila Novotná, and she warned him, don't go back to uh, Czechoslovakia at that point. And, um, so uh, he, he was asked uh, 
to perform this piano concerto, which is the only one actually that uh, Dvořák wrote, and uh, he championed it from early on. But he didn't have uh, the score with him. I said manuscript before, but the score. So uh, he was still able to, um, you know, uh, through diplomatic pouch, get the score to him for that performance. And that's the only reason that he had it with him when he went to the United States. And so he was able to then continue to uh, present it. And uh, I don't think it was the first time that he was presenting it in, uh, at this concert uh, on the, in 1942. But in any case, uh, they were all there. And uh, it was a major event, let's say. What else would you like to hear, or shall we try to wrap this up? <laughs> um, I think, yeah, it's a good moment to move okay. on. And thank you so much, Maida, and I hope everybody goes into the Duosha room, which is right across the lobby here, and sees this great exhibition that Maida put together with uh, uh, photographs and facsimiles of programs, and there's captions that you can look at. Yeah, I'll just mention there that this is a uh, the private archive of Yarmila Novotna's son, George Dalbeck. And it's at, in the process of being repatriated to uh, the Czech Republic because um, the um, home, the estate where Dalbeck's family, his father was Baron Dalbeck, George Dalbeck. So uh, their estate was um, expropriated and uh, but eventually bought by a family that now uh, has formed a Yarmil and Novotna Society. So all of this archive, which has been here in America with George Dabek in Pound Ridge, New York, until now is being returned. And he just held out these photographs for me uh, so we could show them and they're quite special. Uh, so uh, we're very grateful to him for making that available. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Maida. So before we uh, open up the questions from all of you, um, there's just, I have one question, last question for Eva. Uh, it's not a surprise question, but um, the, the book, the, uh, Ticket to the New World, says that it offers a new perspective on Czech-American relations. So what is that new perspective? Uh, well, the main thing uh, is that uh, I believe that knowing the history uh, will really help us to create a um, better future and also evaluate the recent situation which really is really difficult, you know in the world. So uh, it's important to sort of uh, find out uh, these stories and put them down. Uh, it's important for the uh, people in the Czech Republic because uh, some of them, some of the people who are mentioned in the book uh, are almost unknown and would be forgotten. Uh, it is also important for our compatriots here in uh, in America because uh, it's just uh, it's something uh, that uh, uh, that there is something to follow. There is something what was really important and uh, what this uh, this really should be uh, should be safe and should be mentioned and. Um, uh, at the same time, it is important for general American public because these people are really were contributing uh, their best uh, and were trying to really uh, bring their, what they uh, sort of brought from their original country, they brought it and supported American culture. So uh, basically both uh, nations work together here and, uh, and all the people were trying uh, are trying to sort of strengthen the democratic ideals and cultural ideals. Thank you. Okay, thank you.